it's academic and it's theater, the place where they both meet. We have the audience and the participants for each other. Intellectual practices, historical practices, cultural Samples of women sharing. What is that you do sharing? How do you do that? There's no way you can ignore that film anymore. We're from all around the world. You can come and see me talk about it. This starts out of a little thing, you write it in, you have to be completely forthcoming. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's it, what should be done? And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on that. the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center um, at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke and I'm the director of the Siegel Center and part of the faculty. And it's a, a great honor today or tonight, this evening, to have with us Martin Pochner from uh, the Harvard uh, uh, Theater Department and also as a professor of comparative literature and English literature. So thank you, Martin, for coming. And he's joining us um, on an improvisation, basically, on a book which we think is really a fundamental, fantastic contribution. He has uh, made uh, many, many uh, uh, great contributions to the field of literature, also for theater. And um, this um, um, evening is kind of a, a look, a performance, a performance of knowledge of this book. And uh, we hope you will enjoy uh, that journey with us. Uh, it will be in two parts. Uh, we will have four readings. And look, it's all the readers will be in the program, then there's a small uh, break in between where we have some cake and cookies and some tea. Then there will be the four other reasons. Each one's eight to 10 minutes, and they're followed by a discussion if you still have the time to be here. We also would like to welcome Anita Foltzwein, who is a, a great supporter of uh, uh, Martin and the theater program um, in Harvard, and it's a, a great honor to have her here with us. And we also know her well. There's also Marvin Carlson here is with us, who will uh, is also part of the, the readers and many of our visiting scholars. So thank you, everybody. It's the beginning of the uh, spring season, even so it doesn't feel like a spring season. It's the third Northeastern in 10 days. Uh, the second one was for two days during our film festival, so we don't really know how they all got together. But Martin said he even gave a talk on every day of the three uh, Northeasterners. So it must be some connection um, with it. So uh, the evening shouldn't be longer than uh, 100, 110 minutes. Normally it's 90 minutes, an hour and a half, but this is a special evening. Um, and we also welcome uh, our clarinetist, Alexa, for uh, joining us, who will uh, connect the different um, episodes um, uh, with us. So, um, and uh, if you have a cell phone, now it's the time. Normally I take mine out and show it, but I left it at home. So, uh, so please do, do have a look at it. It should say ringer off and... Um, and uh, uh, no sound. After the whole event, we will additionally have a little reception in case there's an additional question you would like to add Martin or any one of the performers. And uh, again, thank you all uh, for coming. Thanks for the crew. It's the beginning of our season. Thanks for Amir. Uh, he is one of our uh, great students here at the PhD program in theater, who is a liaison between the program and the Seeger Center. And he directed, he put it together, arranged the text. He's the Spielleiter, as Fassbinder said about his work. Uh, uh, <laughs> leader of the games tonight. So thank you all um, very much. And um, I would like to ask Martin to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the book, the, the idea, and what's behind it. Thank you. Great. So when you, we're going to take you on a story, the story of literature. And when you tell a story, it's good to start at the beginning. Now, it's very hard to know how and when and where exactly writing was invented. But the best guess is that it was invented about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, what's today Iraq. Um, and there is a story Mesopotamian scribes told about the invention of writing. And I think that story is the best entry into, the, into this um, hidden world of, of the emergence of writing 
5,000 years ago. The story is set in the city of Uruk. The city of Uruk is the, really one of the first cities in human history. Intensive forms of agriculture have made it possible for the first time to bring people together in a condensed space. About 50,000 people lived in the city of Uruk. And they, because the hinterland, the agricultural hinterland, was, was for the first time able to feed that many people. It was a city made out of clay. The city walls were made out of clay. The houses of the city of Uruk were made out of clay. Um, the vessels from, in which food was brought from the countryside into the city were made out of clay. There's even clay piping, clay sickles, almost everything in that city was made out of clay. But the most important invention um, was this, clay riding, riding on clay. And so this is how the Mesopotamian scribes imagined that this invention happened. It featured the king of Uruk, who is trying to subdue a mountain rival, the king of Arata. So he takes a messenger, he sends the messenger to Arata with a threat trying to get uh, Arata to submit to Uruk. But Arata is not impressed by this threat, sends the messenger back with a challenge. If the king of Uruk can take some of his rich grain, that's the, the grain that grows in the mountain plain, in the, in the plains between the rivers, uh, Euph Euphrates and Tigris, if, he, if the king of Uruk can transport this grain in nets, then maybe the king of Arata will submit. So the king of Uruk tries to imagine how he could do that, how to meet this challenge, and he comes up with an idea. He lets the grain sprout. That makes, him, makes it possible to put it in, the, in, the, in, in nets, and he gives the nets to the messenger and sends the messenger up into the mountains. But the king of Arata is still not impressed and sends the messenger back with another challenge, and the king of Uruk meets this challenge and back and forth, and never does the king of Arata submit. And this really enrages the king of Uruk, and he launches into this long, angry rant. And the messenger is standing next to him and panics because he can't remember this long rant. And it is at this point in the story that the king of Uruk takes some clay, forms it into a tablet, and presses his words onto clay. He gives the clay tablet in a clay envelope to the messenger. The messenger takes it, runs one more time up into the mountains, and gives it to the king of Arata and says, this is the message. The king of Arata, of course, doesn't know what writing is. He looks at this clay object, holds it to his ears, can't hear the message, and then in front of his entire court, he submits to Uruk. <laughs> There are two things that are interesting, I think, about the story, really the oldest story about the invention of writing. The first is that it's a very self-serving story. It's told, after all, by scribes who praise the power of their technology. It's the sheer power of this little piece of clay that accomplishes what threats and the threat of invasion didn't accomplish. The other interesting thing about it is that it has, it has nothing to do with literature. And it's true that the earliest uses of writing were exactly this, for bureaucratic and political and economic purposes. Writing was used by tax collectors who were trying to write down economic transactions. And so for hundreds of years, this is what writing was used for. It gave rise to the first bureaucracies, to the first state functionaries. Accountants, writing was invented and used by accountants. But that at some point, one of these accountants used writing for a completely different purpose, and that was to write down a story. And this, for me, is really the beginning, the beginning of literature, the beginning of the written world, the intersection of storytelling with writing technologies. Because, of course, stories had been told orally for hundreds of years, forever, for thousands of years, forever, for however long humans had command of language. But at this point, about 5,000 years ago, writing intersected with storytelling. And out of this intersection arose the first great written text, the Epic of Gilgamesh.
He who saw the wellspring, the foundations of the land, who knew the ways, was wise in all things. Gilgamesh, who saw the wellspring, the foundations of the land, he knew the ways, was wise in all things. He it was who inspected holy places everywhere. Full understanding of it all he gained. He saw what was secret and revealed what was hidden. He brought back tidings from before the flood. From a distant journey came home, weary, at peace. Engraved all his hardships on a monument of stone. He built the walls of ramparted Uruk, the lustrous treasury of hallowed Iana. See its upper wall, whose facing gleams like copper. Gaze at the lower structure, which nothing will equal. Mount the stone stairway, there from days of old. Approach Iana, the dwelling of Ishtar, which no future king, no human being will equal. Go up, pace out the walls of Uruk, study the foundation terrace, and examine the brickwork. Is not its masonry of kiln-fired brick? And did not seven masters lay its foundations? One square mile of city, one square mile of gardens, one square mile of clay pits a half square mile of Ishtar's dwelling. Three and a half square miles is the measure of Uruk. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utanapishtim, the distant one, as I look upon you, Utanapishtim, your limbs are not different. You are just as I am. Indeed, you are not different at all. You are just as I am. Yet your heart is drained of battle spirit. You lie flat on your back, your arm idle. You then, how did you join the ranks of the gods and find eternal life? Udunapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, I will reveal to you, O Gilgamesh, a secret matter, and a mystery of the gods I will tell you. The city of Shurupak, a city you yourself have knowledge of, which once was set on the bank of the Euphrates, that aforesaid city was ancient, and gods once were within it. The great gods resolved to send the deluge. Their father Anu was sworn the counselor, the valiant Inlil, their throne bearer Ninurta, their canal officer Enugi, their leader Ea was sworn with them. He repeated their plans to the reed fence. Reed fence, reed fence, wall, wall. Listen, O reed fence. Pay attention, O wall. O man of Shuparak, son of Ubartutu, wreck house, build boat, forsake possessions and seek life. Belongings reject and life save. Take aboard the boat seed of all living things, the boat you shall build. Let her dimensions be measured out. Let her width and length be equal. Roof her over like the watery depths. I understood full well. I said to Ea, my lord, your command, my lord, exactly as you said it. I shall faithfully execute it. What shall I answer the city, the populace, and the elders? Ea made ready to speak, saying to me, his servant, so you shall speak to them thus. No doubt Enlil dislikes me. I shall not dwell in your city. I shall not set my foot on the dry land of Enlil. I shall descend to the watery depths and dwell with my lord Ea. Upon you he shall shower down in abundance, a windfall of birds, a surprise of fishes. He shall pour upon you a harvest of riches, in the morning cakes and spates, in the evening grains and rains. By the setting of Shamash, the ship was completed, since boarding was very difficult, they brought up gangplanks, fore and aft. They came up her sides, two-thirds of her height. Whatever I had, I loaded upon her. What silver I had, I loaded upon her. What gold I had, I loaded upon her. What living creatures I had, I loaded upon her. I sent up on board all my family and kin, beasts of the steppe, wild animals of the steppe, all types of skilled craftsmen I sent up on board. Shamash set for me the appointed time, in the morning, cakes and spates. In the evening, grains and rains. Go into your boat and caulk the door. That appointed time arrived. In the morning, cakes and spates. In the evening, grains and rains. I gazed upon the face of the storm. The weather was dreadful to behold. I went into the boat and caulked the door. To the caulker of the boat, to Puzara Murray, the boatman, I gave over the edifice with all it contained. At the first glimmer of dawn, a black cloud rose above the horizon. Inside it, Adad was thundering, while the destroying gods Shalat and Hanish went in front, moving as an advance force over hill and plain. Erakal tore out the mooring posts of the world. Ninurta came and made the dikes overflow. 
The supreme gods held torches aloft, setting the land ablaze with their glow. Adad's awesome power passed over the heavens. Whatever was light was turned into darkness. Adad's awesome power passed over the heavens. He flooded the land. He smashed it like a clay pot. For one day, the storm wind blew. Swiftly it blew. The flood came forth. It passed over the people like a battle. No one could see the one next to him. The people could not ride, uh, recognize one another in the downpour. The gods became frightened of the deluge. They shrank back, went up to Anu's highest heaven. The dogs cowered like dogs, crouching outside. Ishtar screamed like a woman in childbirth. And sweet-voiced Belel Eli wailed aloud, Would that day had come to naught when I spoke up for evil in the assembly of the gods. How could I have spoken up for evil in the assembly of the gods and spoken up for battle to destroy my people? It was I myself who brought my people into the world. Now, like a school of fish, they choke up the sea. The supreme gods were weeping with her. The gods sat where they were, weeping. Their lips were parched, taking on a crust. Six days and seven nights, the wind continued. The deluge and windstorm leveled the land. When the seventh day arrived, the windstorm and deluge left off their battle, which had struggled like a woman in labor. The sea grew calm. The tempest stilled. The deluge ceased. I looked at the weather, stillness reigned, and the whole human race had turned into clay. The landscape was flat as a rooftop. I opened the hatch. Sunlight fell upon my face. Falling to my knees, I sat down weeping, tears running down my face. I looked at the edges of the world, the borders of the sea. At 12 times 60 double leagues, the periphery emerged. The boat had come to rest on Mount Nimush. Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. One day, a second day, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. A third day, a fourth day, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. A fifth day, a sixth day, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, not letting it move. When the seventh day arrived, I brought out a dove and set it free. The dove went off and returned. No landing place came to its view, so it turned back. I brought out a swallow and set it free. The swallow went off and returned. No landing place came to its view, so it turned back. I brought out a raven and set it free. The raven went off and saw the ebbing of the waters. It ate, preened, left droppings, did not turn back. I released all to the four directions. I brought out an offering and offered it to the four directions. I set up an incense offering on the summit of the mountain. I arranged seven and seven cult vessels. I heaped reeds, cedar, and myrtle in their bowls. The gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet. The crowds crowded around the sacrificer like flies. As soon as Belet Ali arrived, she held up the great fly ornaments that Anu had made in his order. O oh gods, these shall be my lapis necklace, lest I forget. I shall be mindful of these days and not forget, not ever. The gods should come to the incense offering, but Enlil should not come to the incense offering, for he irrationally brought on the flood and marked my people for destruction. As soon as Enlil arrived, he saw the boat. Enlil flew into a rage. He was filled with fury at the gods. Who came th all through alive? No man was to survive destruction. Ninurta made ready to speak, said to the valiant Enlil, who but Ea could contrive such a thing, for Ea alone knows every artifice. Ea made ready to speak, said to the valiant Enlil, you, O valiant one, are the wisest of the gods. How could you irrationally have brought on the flood? Punish the wrongdoer for his wrongdoing. Punish the transgressor for his transgression. But be lenient, lest he be cut off. Bear with him, lest he be cut off. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let the lion rise up to diminish the human race. Instead of bringing on a flood, let the wolf rise up and diminish the human race. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let famine rise up to wreak havoc in the land. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let pestilence rise up to wreak havoc in the land. It was not I who disclosed the secret of the great gods. I made Atrahis have a dream, and so he heard the secret of the gods. Now then, make some plan for him. Then Enlil came up into the boat, leading me by the hand. He brought me up too. He brought my wife up and had her kneel beside me. He touched our brows, stood between us to bless us. Hitherto, Utanapishtim has been a human being. Now Utanapishtim and his wife shall become like us gods.
So this becomes the great first great text in world literature. It gets collected in libraries, but the library in which this text is collected burns down. And the text would have been lost if it hadn't been written on clay. Because when clay burns down, it doesn't burn up, it gets harder. So these tablets on which the Epic of Gilgamesh had been written hardened and they were buried underground and they disappeared from all human consciousness for thousands of years until they were rediscovered in the 19th century in Victorian England and redeciphered. And to their great surprise, Victorian England discovered that the story of the flood, which of course everyone knew from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, had existed in this earlier form in the Epic of Gilgamesh. You noticed the reading was on tablets. And it's interesting to me <laughs> that for the first time in, again, thousands of years, we are using tablets again. So the Epic of Gilgamesh almost disappeared, but was miraculously preserved and was rediscovered in this form. This is not true of the next text, the next reading from the Odyssey, which has remained more or less in continuous use ever since it was written down. It was written down in a new form of writing. Cuneiform writing is a very complicated writing system. It's not a phonetic alphabet. It had there are hundreds of cuneiform signs. But Phoenicians in today's Lebanon had invented the first form of the alphabet and they brought it to Greece and the Greeks perfected the alphabet and formed out of it a writing system that was perfectly suited to capturing sound and especially vowels. And this is what the Greek hexameter and in general the Greek language is so importantly based on. And one of the first uses of the Greek alphabet was not economic transactions that had been the case in Mesopotamia, but one of the first uses was to write down this, the stories of the Trojan War and the return of the various Greek warriors to their home. The, and in particular, the stories of one singer, Homer, and an anonymous write, scribe wrote down these stories of both the, the Trojan War and of the return of Odysseus home. And it was that second epic that became of particular importance for the Greeks because the Greeks were seafaring people. And so part of their everyday experience was encounters with other people. And this is what the reading will be about. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered in the storms at sea and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. 
he failed to keep them safe, poor fools. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. With heavy hearts, we sailed along and reached the country of high-minded cyclopes, the mavericks. They put their trust in gods and do not plant their food from seed nor plow. And yet the barley, grain, and clustering wine grapes all flourish there, increased by rain from Zeus. They hold no councils, have no common laws, but live in caves on lofty mountaintops, and each makes laws for his own wife and children without concern for what the others think. A distance from this island is another, across the water, slant ways from the harbor, level and thickly wooded. Countless goats live there, but people never visit it. No hunters labor through its woods to scale its hilly peaks. There are no flocks of sheep, no fields of plowland, and it's all untilled, unsown, and uninhabited by humans. Only the bleeding goats live there and graze. Cyclopic people have no red check chips and no shipwright among them who could build boats to enable them to row across to other cities, as most people do, crossing the sea to visit one another with boats. They could have turned this island into a fertile colony with proper harvests. We soon were at the cave, but did not find the cyclops. He was pasturing his flocks. We went inside and looked at everything. We saw his crates weighed down his cheese and pens, crammed full of lambs divided up by age, the newborns, middlings, and those just weaned. There were well-crafted bowls, bowls and pails for milking, all full of whey. My crew begged, let us grab some cheese and quickly drive the kids and lambs out to the pens and down to our Swiss ships and sail away across the salty water. That would have been the better choice. But I refused. I hoped to see him and find out if he would give us gifts. Strangers, who are you? Where did you come from across the watery depths? Are you on business or roaming around without a goal like pirates who risk their lives at sea to bring disaster to other people? So he spoke. His voice so deep and booming and his giant size made our hearts sink in terror. Even so, I answered. We are Greeks. Come here from Troy. The winds have swept us off in all directions across the vast expanse of sea, of course, from our planned route back home. Zeus willed it so. We are proud to be the man of Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, whose fame is greatest under the sky for sacking that vast city and killing many people. Now we beg you here at your knees to grant a gift, as is the norm for hosts and guests. Please, sir, my lord, respect the gods. We are your suppliants, and Zeus is on our side, since he takes care of visitors, guests, friends, and those in need. Unmoved, he said. Well, foreigner, you are a fool, or from some very distant country. You order me to fear the gods. My people think nothing of that Zeus with his big scepter, nor any god, our strength is more than theirs. If I spare you or spare your friends, it will not be out of fear of Zeus. I do the bidding of my own heart. But he made no reply and showed no mercy. Leaping up high, he reached his hands towards my men, seized two and knocked them hard against the ground like puppies. And the floor was wet with brains. He ripped them limb by limb to make his meal, then ate them like 
a lion on the mountains, devouring flesh, entrails, and marrow bones, and living nothing. I was left scheming to take revenge on him and hurt him and gain the glory if Athena let me. I made my plan. Beside the pen there stood a great big club, green olive wood, which he had cut to dry to be his walking stick. It was so massive that it looked to us like a ship's mast, a 20 oared black freighter that sails across the vast sea full of cargo. I went and cut from it about a fathom and gave it to the men and ordered them to scrape it down. They made it smooth, and I stood by and sharpened up the tip and made it hard in the blazing flame. At evening, he drove back his woolly flocks into the spacious cave, both male and female, and left none in the yard outside, perhaps suspecting something, or perhaps a god told him to do it. I approached and offered him a cup of ivy wood filled full of wine. I said, here, Cyclops, you have eaten human meat. Now drink some wine, sample the merchandise our ship contains. I brought it as a holy offering, so you might pity me and send me home. But you are in a cruel rage beyond what anyone could bear. Do you expect more guests when you have treated us so rudely? He took and drank the sweet, delicious wine. He loved it and demanded more. So I gave him another cup of wine and then two more. He drank them all unwisely. With the wine gone to his head, I told him all politeness. Cyclops, you ask my name. I will re reveal it. Uh, then you must give the gift you promised me of hospitality. My name is No Man. My family and friends all call me No Man. He answered with no pity in his heart. I will eat No Man last. First, I will eat the other man. Uh, that is my gift to you. Uh, then he collapsed, fell on his back, and lay there his massive neck askew, all conquering sheep. Sleep, sorry, took him. My crew stood firm. Some god was breathing courage in us. They took the olive spear, its tip all sharp, and shoved it in his eye. I leaned on top and twisted it as when a man drills wood for shipbuilding. Below, the workers spin the drill with straps stretched out from either end. So round and round it goes, and so we whirled the fire-sharp weapon in his eye. His blood poured out around the stake, and blazing fire sizzled his lids and brows and fried the roots. And when a blacksmith dips an axe or adds to temperate in ice-cold water, loudly it shrieks. From this, the iron takes on its power. So did his eyeball crackle on the spear. Horribly, then he howled. The rocks resounded, and we shrank back in fear. He tucked the spear out of his eye, all soaked with gushing blood. Desperately, with both hands, he hurled it from him and shouted to the cyclopes who lived in caves high up on the windy cliffs around. They heard and came from every side and stood near to the cave and called out, Polyphemus! What is the matter? Are you badly hurt? Why are you screaming through the holy night and keeping us awake? Is someone stealing your hurt or trying to kill you by some trick or force? Strong Polyphemus from inside replied, My friends, no man is killing me by tricks, not force. Their words flew back to him. If no one hurts you, you are all alone. Great Zeus had made you sick. No help for that. Pray to your father, mighty Lord Poseidon. Then off they went. And I laughed to myself at how my name, the no man maneuver, tricked him. As you can see, the tablet has been replaced by the scroll. And the other thing I want to say about this is that it's a new translation by Emily Wilson. It's a fantastic new translation of the Odyssey and remarkably the first translation of the Odyssey into English by a woman. So this is a wonderful new translation. So we are now inhabiting a world in which more and more cultures 
have these foundational texts, texts, epics, that become reference points for their cultures, more and more cultures where that intersection of storytelling and writing technology happens. What's interesting is that now, in some of the most literate cultures uh, of the world, a strange new phenomenon occurs. Charismatic teachers who introduce new ways of thinking and teaching and who assemble a larger and larger following. Um, people who leave their homes, who leave their old ways of thinking and follow these charismatic teachers. And within a few hundred years of each other, they appear in different cultures. In China, the name of this key teacher will be Master Kung, whom we know as Confucius. In Greece, his name is Socrates. In the Near East, his name is Jesus. And in India, his name is the Buddha. Now, these four charismatic teachers have many things in common. But one of the most important thing is that they did not write a single word. Instead, they insisted on this live, interactive relationship to their followers and, and students. And that's, it's on that uh, relationship, on that live interaction, that their charisma and their influence resided. Now, sooner or later, the inevitable happens, and these teachers die. And now the students are faced with an interesting dilemma, namely how to remember their teachers their teachers words and deeds and how to do that even though their teachers had explicitly explicitly decided not to use writing and for very good reasons of the four socrates is the one who made the most explicit argument against writing he was worried that a written text can be very easily taken out of context that you cannot ask follow-up questions of a text and that's once we trust written texts, namely a kind of new external storage device, we would no longer have to know things ourselves. And so we can extrapolate that these other teachers had similar worries about writing and had del deliberately avoided it. But at some point, all of the students of these charismatic teachers decided to do what their teachers had told them not to do. And as teachers, we all know that students ultimately will do what we tell them not to do. They use writing and they produce the texts that we now associate with these charismatic teachers, the Chinese call the master teachers. Now, you might say that these teachers betrayed, the students betrayed their teachers, but I actually would say that the students were very canny because they knew that their teachers, of course, had avoided writing. And so they channeled some of that resistance back into the texts they produced. And what the result of that was that these texts were much more dramatic, much more anecdotal than the old texts, the old epics that we've heard from so far. They show their teachers in live interaction with their students. In the case of Plato, they're even sort of dramatic dialogues, but the other texts have the similar structure. And this is also true of the next reading, the Diamond Sutra, um, the text that many hundreds of years after the death of the Buddha, their students produced about their dead teacher.
Hail to Sakyamuni, the realized, worthy, and perfectly awakened one. This is the word, as I heard it once, when the Lord was staying in Shavasi, in Jetta's Grove, at the monastery of Anatta Pindada, together with a large community of monks, 12,000 or 1,250 monks strong. Then the Lord with, got dressed in the morning, took his bowl and robe, and entered the great city of Srivasta for alms. Then, after walking around the great city of Srivasti for, for alms, the Lord returned in the afternoon after eating the alms food, washed his feet, and sat down on the seat next set out for him with legs crossed, body held erect, and attention directed in front of him. Then a great many monks approached the Lord, and after approaching him, they prostrated themselves at the Lord's feet, circumambulated the Lord three times, and sat down to one side. The Lord said this to them, In this regard, Subhuti, those who have set out on the Bodhisattva path should have the following thought. However many living beings are comprised in the total aggregation of living beings, be they born from eggs, or born from wombs, or born from moisture, or arising spontaneously, whether having physical form or being non-material, whether having apperception or lacking apperception, or neither having apperception nor lacking apperception, however the realm of living beings is defined when one defines it, I should bring all of them to final extinction, in the realm of extinction, without substrate remaining. But after I have brought immeasurable living beings to final extinction in this way, no living being whatsoever has been brought to extinction. What is the reason for that? If, Subhuti, the idea of living being occurs to a bodhisattva, he should not be called a bodhisattva. Why is that? Subhuti, anybody to whom the idea of a living being occurs, or the idea of a soul, or the idea of a person occurs, should not be called a bodhisattva. However, a bodhisattva should not give a gift while fixing on an object, Subhuti. He should not give a gift while fixing on anything. He should not give a gift while fixing on physical forms. He should not give a gift while fixing on sounds, smells, tastes, or objects of touch, or on dharmas. For this is the way, Subhuti, a bodhisattva should give a gift so that he does not fix on the idea of the distinctive features of any object. Why is that? Subhuti, of the bodhisattva that gives a gift without fixation, what do you think, Subhuti? Is it easy to take the measure of space in the East? Subhuti said, indeed not, Lord. Similarly, is it easy to take the measure of space in the south, west, north, nadir, zenith, all the intermediate directions and any direction besides them in the ten directions? Subhuti said, indeed not, Lord. The Lord said, quite so, Subhuti, quite so, Subhuti. It is not easy to take the measure of the quantity of merit of the bodhisattva, who gives a gift without fixation. However, this is the way a bodhisattva should give a gift. Subhuti as an instance of the meritorious activity which consists in giving. What do you think, Subhuti? Can a tathagata be seen by virtue of the possession of distinctive features? Subhuti said, a tathagata cannot be seen by virtue of the possession of distinctive features. Why is that? 
the very thing which the Tathagata has preached as the possession of distinctive features lacks any possession of distinctive features. At these words, the Lord said this to the venerable Subhuti. Subhuti, as long as there is any distinctive feature, there is falsehood. Accordingly, it is by virtue of the featurelessness of, this, of his distinctive features that a Tathagata can be seen. At these words, the venerable Subhuti said this to the Lord. Can it be, Lord, that there will be any living beings at a future time when the final 500 years come to pass who, when the words of such discourses as these are being spoken, will conceive the idea that they are the truth? The Lord said, Subhuti, you must not say things like, can it be there will be any living beings beings at a future time when the final 500 years come to pass, who, when the words of such discourses as these are being spoken, will conceive the idea that they are the truth. On the contrary, Subhuti, there will be bodhisattvas and mahasattvas at future time, when in the few final 500 years the destruction of the true dharma is coming to pass, who will be endowed with moral conduct, good qualities, and insight. Moreover, it is not the case, Subhuti, that the bodhisattvas will have served a single Buddha, or that they will have planted the roots of goodness under a single Buddha. On the contrary, Subhuti, they will have served many Buddhas. And those who, when the words of such discourses as these are spoken, will experience the serenity of faith even if it is for no more than a single thought. The Tathagata knows them, Subhuti. The Tathagata sees them, Subhuti. They will all generate and come to be endowed with an immeasurable quality of merit. Why is that? Because, Subhuti, the idea of a self will not occur to these bodhisattvas nor will the idea of living being or the idea of a soul or the idea of a person occur to them. Not even the idea of a dharma will occur to these bodhisattvas, Subhuti, nor the idea of a non-dharma. Not even the idea of a non-idea will occur to them. Why is that? If, Subhuti, the idea of a dharma should occur to those bodhisattvas, for them that would constitute seizing upon a self. It would constitute seizing upon a living being, seizing upon a soul, seizing upon a person. If the idea of a non-dharma should occur for them, that would constitute seizing upon a self, seizing upon a living being, seizing upon a soul, seizing upon a person. Why is that? One should, moreover, not take up any dharma, subhuti, or any non-dharma. It was, therefore, with this in mind that the Tathagata said, those who understand the round of teachings of the simile of the raft should let go of the dharmas themselves, to say nothing of the non-dharmas. The Lord said, what do you think, Subhuti? If there were just as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River, would the grains of sand in them be numerous? <coughs> Subhuti said, that many Ganges rivers alone would be numerous, Lord, to say nothing of the grains of sand in them. The Lord said, I'll tell you, Subhuti, I'll have you know if there were as many world systems as there are, as there would be grains of sand in these Ganges rivers, and some woman or man were to fill them with the seven treasures and make a gift of them to the realized, worthy, and perfectly awakened ones, 
What do you think, Sabuti? Would that woman or man generate a lot of merit on that basis? Sabuti said, a lot, Lord. A lot, blessed one. That woman or man would generate a lot of merit on that basis. The Lord said, if, however, some were to fill that many world systems with the seven treasures and make a gift of them, Sabuti, and if someone were to do no more than just learn four lines of verse from this round of teachings and teach it to others, the latter would generate from that a lot more merit in immeasurable and incalculable amount. Because you can accrue so much more merit by teaching this sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the monks who carried the Diamond Sutra and other teachings of the Buddha to China, where it was translated into Chinese, and where it encountered two new inventions in writing technology that will revolutionize the world of literature, namely paper and print. This image is of the Diamond Sutra from 868, and it's the oldest printed text in the world. And we understand now why, because there's so much merit accrued by teaching and replicating these teachings that Buddhist monks were the first adopters of paper and print, because it allowed them to generate many, many copies of this text and therefore accrue more and more merit in doing so than they could have if they had just hand copied these texts as they would have had to do before. So these two inventions, paper and print, really changed a lot. They dropped the price, the cost of literature, and that allowed new people to enter the world of literature and to tell new stories, and to tell stories in different ways. For many hundreds of years, the secret of paper making stayed in China, but it slowly moved to other countries, including Korea and then via Korea to Japan. And it's in Japan that it uh, led to a flowering of Japanese literature, and in particular, more popular forms of literature, because that was one of the effects of paper. The early adopters were not just religious texts or philosophical texts like the Buddhist sutras, but also now more popular forms of writing. And so this brings us to our next reading, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. Now, even though there is more literacy now in Japan, it was still the case that women were, women were mostly kept illiterate. And even when they achieved literacy, they would not be inducted into the long tradition of Chinese literature that was still very central to Japan. So the young Murasaki Shikibu, who wanted to learn the Chinese literary traditions, had to do so in secret by spying on when her older brother was being tutored and therefore indirectly or by spying uh, acquiring literacy in Chinese literature, literature and soon excelling her brother. She got married and then when her husband died, acquired a position at court as a lady in waiting. And she used that position to slowly start to chronicle what was happening around her. And these chapters grew and they were passed around by hand, they were written by hand, and they became so popular that she produced more and more chapters of the secret world of the court to which she was a witness. And the result of that was the first great novel in world literature.
With no one to talk to and idle time to kill after the healing rites were completed, he stepped out under cover of the heavy evening mist and set off with Koromitsu towards the fence he had spotted earlier. Peering at the bishop's residence through gaps in the fence, he could see into a room on the near side that faced Amida's pure land in the west. The blinds had been raised slightly, which allowed him to observe a nun performing religious devotions before her own personal image of Amida Buddha. She was apparently making an offering of flowers. Leaning against one of the central pillars, she had placed a sutra scroll on top of an, of an armrest and was struggling to read the scripture. She did not look like a common woman. She was probably over 40, her complexion exceptionally fair and grateful. graceful. Though she was thin, her cheeks were plump and the strands of her hair, which had been cut attractively to neatly frame the area around her eyes, struck Genji as more distinctively fashionable than the long hair that was the common style. Watching her, he was touched by her appearance. Two pretty adult attendants, also neatly turned out, were with her, and some young girls were playing there, running in and out of the room. One of them, who must have been about 10 years old, was wearing a white singlet under a soft, crinkled outer robe dyed the rich yellow of mountain rose and lined with a yellow fabric. She didn't look like the other girls at all. Her features were so attractive that Genji could tell at once that she would grow up to be a woman of surpassing beauty. Her hair flowed out behind her, spreading open in the shape of a fan as she stood there, her face red from brushing tears away. What happened? The nun asked her. Did you get into a quarrel with the other girls? When the nun looked up to speak, Genji could see the resemblance in their faces and assumed that they must be mother and daughter. Inuki let my baby sparrow out of the cage and it flew away. The girl was pouting. One of the young women sitting there said, careless as usual. Inuki's in for a real scolding this time. What a nuisance she is. So where did the sparrow go? It's such a darling little thing. It would be horrid if the crows get to it. She stood up and went out, her hair quite long and luxuriant. Certainly easy on the eyes, Genji thought. Apparently she was the nurse who looked after the little girl. How childish, the nun said. Really, this whole thing is just too petty. You pay no heed to me, even though I could pass away any day now and instead go running about chasing after sparrows. How many times have I told you it's a sin in the sight of Buddha to capture living creatures? It's deplorable. Come over here. The girl knelt down beside her. Her face was remarkably sweet. Her unplucked eyebrows had the most charming air about them, and the cut of her hair and the look of her forehead, with those bangs swept up so innocently, were unbearably cute. Genji couldn't stop gazing at her. I'd really love to see her when she's grown up, he mused. It, it occurred to him that his desire to see her grown up was kindled by her uncanny resemblance to Fujitsubu, the, the woman to whom his heart was eternally devoted. It was thus natural that his gaze would be drawn to the girl, and tears came to his eyes. Stroking the child's hair, the nun told her, you may not be fond of combing your hair, but it's so lovely. You're such a silly girl, and your childishness weighs heavily on my mind. Other girls, other children your age don't act like this. Even though your mother was only 10 when her father passed away, she still understood everything going on around her. It won't be long before I die and you'll be left completely alone in the world. How will you ever manage to get by? Seeing the nun weep so bitterly, Genji felt a pang of sympathetic sorrow. The girl with her childish emotions stared at her grandmother, then hung her head and stared at the floor. Her hair came cascading down around her face. It was splendidly lustrous. Just then the nun composed a verse. The evanescent dewdrop tarries reluctant to disappear into the sky and abandon the tender shoot of grass to its uncertain fate. The other young woman who was still sitting in the room was now crying. How true, she said, and composed this reply. How could the dewdrop disappear without knowing the destiny of the shoot of grass it clings to? Just then the bishop entered and said, what are you doing? You're clearly visible from the outside. Why, today of all days, are you out on the veranda? 
I just found out from the ascetic who lives up the mountain that his lordship, Captain Genji, has arrived to receive treatment for his fever. He arrived in such secrecy that I knew nothing about it. I've been here all this time and didn't pay my respects to him. How awful, the nun said, lowering the blinds. Has anyone seen us like this? We're not at all presentable. Don't you want to take this opportunity, asked the bishop, to catch a glimpse of the radiant Genji? After all, he has such a noble reputation at the court. His looks are enough to make even the heart of a monk who has renounced society forget the sorrows of life and desire to live on in this world. I shall send him a letter. Upon hearing the bishop stand up to leave, Genji also retired, delighted at the thought that he had discovered such a gorgeous child under these circumstances. His amorous companions were always going out, and so they were skilled at finding the kind of unusual woman that one rarely meets at court. Genji, however, could only go out occasionally, and so he was even more delighted to have the unexpected good fortune to stumble across a girl like this. She was certainly lovely, but her beauty made him curious. Who was she? She resembled Fujitsubo so closely that he was completely taken with the notion that he might be able to make her a replacement for the woman he loved, keeping the girl by him mornings and evenings as a comfort to his heart. I'm going to skip a descriptive passage in which uh, Genji can't sleep, and then he realizes the nuns are still awake, so he makes a noise to catch their attention. He heard one of the women moving over toward him. Apparently confused, she retreated a bit and said, that's odd, I thought I heard something. I must be deluded. Genji spoke up. They say the guiding voice of the Buddha will never delude you or lead you astray, even in the darkest places. His voice was so youthful and aristocratic that her own voice sounded hesitant and embarrassed in response. Guiding to where, she asked. I'm not sure I understand you. You probably think something is amiss, which is reasonable since I called out so suddenly. Please present the following to your mistress. Glimpsing that sweet child so like a shoot of spring grass, the sleeves of my traveling robes never dry out, damp as they are from dew, and my own endless tears. The woman responded, you surely must know there's no one here who would accept that kind of message. To whom would I give it? It so happens, Genji explained, that I have reasons for my entreaty, and so I ask for your understanding. The woman retreated back into the interior of the house and spoke with the nun, who was confused by the request. It was, after all, shocking in so many respects. Really, these young people and their modern ways, she grumbled. Apparently, this lord is under the misapprehension that the girl is old enough to understand the relationship between men and women. And how did he come to hear about our poems that referred to her as spring grass? She was confused, but realized it would be rude to take an inordinately long time to respond, so she sent the following. Are you comparing the dew-soaked pillow of a single night's journey to these sleeves covered by the moss of ancient mountains? Unlike your robe, she added, it seems that mine will never dry. I'm not very experienced at communicating this way through a messenger, Genji answered. Please forgive me, but I would be grateful if you would allow me a moment to speak with you about a serious matter. The nun turned to her attendants. I'm afraid he's mistakenly heard that the girl is older than she is. He seems such a high-ranking lord that I feel humbled before him. How should I respond? You must answer him, one of her women advised. It would be a pity if you made him feel awkward. Yes, I suppose you're right, the nun relented. But if I were still a young woman, I'd find it rather improper to meet him. His words are so earnest, they make me feel unworthy. She rose and moved nearer to him. I realize that this is all quite sudden for you, Genji said, and that under these circumstances, you must think my request rash and immoderate. But I assure you, I have no base desires in my heart and swear to you that the Amida Buddha himself understands the depths of my feelings, which you seem to find incomprehensible. He spoke in a very respectful manner since he himself was feeling awkward about raising the subject so directly in the presence of her quiet dignity. I must admit, I never imagined that we would meet, the nun responded. But that doesn't mean I consider the karmic bond between us to be shallow. Why should I, since we are speaking to one another like this? I was moved when I heard about the painful struggles the girl has endured, Genji continued. 
and wondered if you would consider me a substitute for the mother who has passed away. I was at a very tender age myself when I lost my mother and grandmother, the ones who should have looked after me most closely. As the months and years have passed, I feel I have been living in a peculiar drifting state. The girl's situation is so similar to my own that I sincerely ask permission to be her companion. Because I'm concerned about how you will interpret my request, I feel constrained in bringing it up. However, I'll have very few opportunities to approach you. I know I should be overjoyed by your request, but I'm reluctant to grant it. I don't know what you've heard about the girl, but isn't it possible that you are misinformed about how old she is? Insignificant though I am, the girl who lives here is completely dependent on me for support, and she's so young I couldn't possibly agree to your request. I know all about her, Genji pressed his case. If you'll just consider the depths of my feelings, which are anything but common, you will put your reservations aside. In spite of his insistent pleadings, the nun was convinced that Genji was unaware of the inappropriateness of the request and would not give her assent. When the bishop returned, Genji at once closed up the folding screen. Well, at least I've pleaded my case. At least I can feel re re relieved about that. So you see, this is a world of paper, of paper screens, of paper fans, but most importantly of these messages that get sent around on carefully selected pieces of paper and wrapped in delicate paper. This is the beginning of the paper trail, and after the uh, intermission, we'll follow that paper trail to the Arabic world. So there is a 10-minute intermission. There's coffee and, and tea and cookies. And then in 10 minutes, we'll be back.
okay. You can take your drink and your cookies to your seat. And um, we can start our second round. It's so it contributes so much. Good. I think it is. It's, So I promised that I would follow the paper trail to the Arabic world, and it's a dramatic, dramatic stories about how the secret of paper making was introduced to the Arabic world. It involves prisoners, Chinese prisoners of war that were taken in a great battle, and the secret of paper making was extracted from them by force. We have no idea whether that story is actually true, but I think it speaks to the fact that people were very aware of the power of paper making because of some of the effects I already mentioned. It lowered the cost of, of literature, it increased literacy, it increased the circulation of literature, and it led to new forms of literature like the tale of Genji. Now in the Arabic world, um, Baghdad became the center of paper making, and paper was really the, the fuel behind the golden age of Arabic letters. Now as in China, they were some of the, the religious texts were some of the early adopters of paper. This is a, a, a wonderful calligraphic page from the Quran. But as in Japan, there is also an explosion of popular literature that was brought about by paper. And this is what leads us to the next reading, namely the Thousand and One Nights a story collection that collects stories from all over the place. There was a continent-spanning network of stories from India, Persia, and Greece that, that uh, a, a kind of stories were moving back and forth, but they were collected in Baghdad and framed by, uh, by, sto by, by scribes and, and editors who collected these stories and, and, and included a new device, a device that would become one of the most um, widespread devices for story collections, namely the frame, a framing story. And the framing story, of course, of the Arabian Nights is the famous story of, of a king who discovers that his wife has various adulterous affairs and who is driven mad by that discovery and then makes that famous vow that he will kill every woman after spending one night with her. Now, as mentioned earlier, 
The vizier who put the girls to death had an older daughter called Shehrazad and a younger one called Dinarzad. The older daughter, Shehrazad, had read the books of literature, philosophy and medicine. She knew poetry by heart, had studied historical reports and was acquainted with the sayings of men and the maxims of sages and kings. She was intelligent, knowledgeable, wise and refined. She had read and learned. One day she said to her father, Father, I will tell you what's in my mind. He asked, what is it? She answered, I would like you to marry me to King Shahrayar so that I may either succeed in saving the people or perish and die like the rest. When the vizier heard what his daughter Shehrazad said, he got angry and said to her, Foolish one, don't you know that King Shahrayar has sworn to spend but one night with a girl and have her put to death the next morning? If I give you to him, he will sleep with you for one night and will ask me to put you to death the next morning, and then I shall have to do it since I cannot disobey him. She said, Father, you must give me to him, even if he kills me. He asked, what has possessed you to that you wish to imperil yourself? She replied, Father, you must give me to him. This is absolute and final. Her father, the vizier, became furious and said to her, Daughter, he who misbehaves ends up in trouble, and he who considers not the end, the world is not his friend. As the popular saying goes, I would be sitting pretty but for my curiosity. I am afraid that what happened to the donkey and the ox with the merchant will happen to you. She asked, Father, what happened to the donkey, the ox, the merchant? He said, There was a prosperous and wealthy merchant who lived in the countryside and labored on a farm. He owned many camels and herds of cattle and employed many men, and he had a wife and many grown-up as well as little children. This merchant was taught the language of the beasts on condition that if he revealed his secret to anyone, he would die. Therefore, even though he knew the language of every kind of animal, he did not let anyone know for fear of death. One day, as he sat with his wife beside him and his children playing before him, he glanced at an ox and a donkey he kept at the farmhouse, tied to adjacent troughs, and heard the ox say to donkey, Watchful one, I hope that you are enjoying the comfort and the service you are getting. Your ground is swept and watered, and they serve you, feed you sifted barley, and offer you clear, cool water to drink. I, on the contrary, am taking out to plow in the middle of the night. They clamp on my neck something they call yoke and plow, push me all day under the whip to plow the field, and drive me beyond my endurance until my sides are lacerated and my neck is flayed. They work me from night time to night time, take me back in the dark, offer me beans soiled with mud and hay mixed with chaff, and let me spend the night lying in urine and dung. Meanwhile, you rest on well-swept, watered and smoothed ground with a clean trough full of hay. You stand in comfort, save for the rare occasion when our master, the merchant, rides you to do an errand and returns. You are comfortable while I'm very. You sleep while I keep awake. When the ox finished, the donkey turned to him and said, Greenhorn, they were right in calling you ox, for you ox harbor no deceit, malice, or meanness. Being sincere, you exert and exhaust yourself to comfort others. Have you not heard the saying, out of bad luck they hastened on the road? You go into the field from early morning to endure your torture at the plow to the point of exhaustion. When the plowman takes you back and ties you to the trough, you go on butting and beating with your horns, kicking with your hoofs and bellowing for the beans until they toss them to you. Then you begin to eat. Next time, when they bring them to you, don't eat or even touch them, but smell them. Then draw back and lie down on the hay and straw. If you do this, life will be better and kinder to you, and you will find relief. As the ox listened, he was sure that the donkey had given him good advice. He thanked him, commanded him to God, and invoked his blessing on him and said, May you stay safe from harm, watchful one. 
and the ox played sick to avoid work, as the donkey advised. The merchant, who heard them and knew what was going on, said to the plowman, go to the wily donkey, put him to the plow, and work him, until, until it, work him hard until he finishes the ox's task. The plowman left, took the donkey, and placed the yoke upon his neck. Then he took him out to the field and drove him with blows until he finished the ox's work, all the while driving, driving him with blows and beating him until his sides were lacerated and his neck was flayed. At nightfall, he took him home, barely able to drag his legs under his tired body and his drooping ears. Meanwhile, the ox spent his day resting. He ate all his food, drank his father water, and lay quietly, chewing his cud in comfort. All day long, he kept praising the donkey's advice and invoking God's blessing on him. When the donkey came back at night, the ox stood up to greet him, saying, Good evening, watchful one. You have done me a favor beyond description, for I have been sitting in comfort. God bless you for my sake. Seething with anger, the donkey did not reply, but said to himself, All this happened to me because of my miscalculation. I would be sitting pretty, but for my curiosity. If I don't find a way to return the socks to his former situation, I will perish. Then he went to his trough and lay down, while the ox continued to chew his cud and invoke God's blessing on him. You, my daughter, will likewise perish because of your miscalculation. Desist, sit quietly, and don't expose yourself to peril. I advise you out of compassion for you. She said, such tales don't deter me from my request. If you wish, I can tell you many such tales. In the end, if you don't take me to King Shahrayar, I shall go to him by myself behind your back and tell him that you have refused to give me to one like him and that you begrudge at your master one like me. Tired and exhausted, the vizier went to King Shahrayar and kissing the ground before him, told him about his daughter, adding that, he would give her to him that very night. She was very happy and after preparing herself and packing what she needed, went to her younger sister Dinarzad and said, Sister, listen well to what I'm telling you. When I go to the king, I will send for you. And when you come and see that the king has finished with me, say, Sister, if you are not sleepy, tell us a story. Then I will begin to tell a story, and it will cause the king to stop his practice, save myself, and deliver the people. Dinarzad replied, very well. At nightfall, the vizier took Shahrazad and went with her to the great king Shahrayar. But when Shahrayar took her, took her to bed and began to fondle her, she wept, and when he asked her, why are you crying, she replied, I have a sister, and I wish to bid her goodbye before daybreak. Then the king sent for the sister, who came and went to sleep under the bed. When the night wore on, she woke up and waited until the king had satisfied himself with her sister Shehrazad, and they were by now all fully awake. Then Dinarzad cleared her throat and said, Sister, if you are not sleepy, Tell us one of your lovely little tales to while away the night before I bid you goodbye at daybreak, for I don't know what will happen to you tomorrow. Shehrazad turned to King Shahrayar and said, May I have your permission to tell a story? He replied, Yes, and Shehrazad was very happy and said, Listen. It is said, O oh wise and happy king, that once there was a prosperous merchant who had abundant wealth and investments and commitments in every country. So you see this framing story begins with the father telling a story in order to, to dissuade her daughter and doesn't succeed, but then Shahrazad herself will succeed in, with all her stories to convert and cure the king 
of his madness. Now, the paper trail leads from the Arabic world to Arab-occupied Spain, Al-Andalus, and so paper, the secret of paper making gets finally introduced to Europe, just in time for the other great Chinese invention, print, to also make its way separately, because print was not used in the Arabic world, to make its way somehow into the city of Mainz, where Gutenberg reinvented print and was able to use paper as the most convenient format for his new invention, or really reinvention. Because as we saw, in China, paper and print had been used many hundreds of years before Europe. One of the first texts Gutenberg prints was the Latin Bible, and he soon prints them in smaller formats because now uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and ordinary priests can, can, can own the Bible in handy pocket editions. And this happens just in time before the Spanish conquistadors discover the new world. So now these priests and conquistadors with their newly printed Bibles arrive in the new world. And for the most part, they encounter civilizations without writing, with one significant exception. In what is now southern Mexico and Guatemala, they encounter the Mayans. And the Mayans have invented writing and have their own writing culture. And this is a fascinating fact because all the other writing cultures that have hitherto existed on the Eurasian continent in Europe and Asia are on that one continent. So they were in contact with each other, which means that it's possible that the invention of writing that happened in Mesopotamia occurred only once and that this idea of writing, of putting words onto clay, traveled to, to China and to, and to Egypt and to the other early writing cultures. And that writing, the idea of putting words onto paper or clay uh, or papyrus or parchment really happened only once in Eurasia. But we know that the Americas were without contact with Europe for the thousands of years when, when writing was developed in Eurasia, which means that the Mayans invented writing on their own and that humans invented writing at least twice. So this is almost like a historical ex control experiment that, that, that tr allows us to observe what happens when writing is invented again. Will the same basic pattern emerge? And that's exactly what happened. There is a class of scribes that presided over this very complicated writing system. And sooner or later, stories were written down and calendars. And these stories became sacred texts. And one of these sacred texts is our next reading, the Papal Vu. Now, as in the case of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Papal Vu almost disappeared because the Spaniards realized that the, these, this, these sacred texts were the center of Mayan culture. And they soon wanted to eradicate that culture. They, so they started a book burning and tried to get every Mayan book uh, uh, and burn it, such as, such as this one. The Mayan books were accordion style. Um, and, and this is the very complicated Mayan glyph writing system. And so Mayan scribes recognized this danger and wrote down the Papal Vu in secret and realized they had to go underground in order to save this text. But they realized something else. They realized that this writing, this complicated writing system, this whole writing culture of the Mayans would soon be wiped out by the Spanish. So in order to be read in the future, they realized they had to write down their epic, which, which they now had contact with Christians, in the Christian alphabet. And that meant in the Latin alphabet. And this is what they did. And this is how the epic, the, 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 epic, the Popol Vuh, was saved.
This is the beginning of the ancient word, here in this place called Chiche. Here we shall inscribe, we shall implant the ancient word, the potential and source for everything done in the citadel of Quiche, in the nation of the Quiche people. And here we shall take up the demonstration, revelation, and account of how things were put in shadow and brought to light by the maker, modeler, named bearer, begetter, Wanapo possum, Wanapo coyote, great white pecciary, sovereign plumed serpent, serpent, heart of the lake, heart of the sea, plate shaper, bowl shaper, as they are called, also named, also described as the midwife, matchmaker, named Shiakuk, Jimukain, defender, protector, twice a mid midwife, twice a matchmaker. As is said in the words of Kiche, they accounted for everything and did it too as enlightened beings in enlightened words. We shall write about this now amid the preaching of God in Christendom now. We shall bring it out because there is no longer a place to see it, a council book, a place to see the light that came from beside the sea, the account of our place in the shadows, a place to see the dawn of life, as it is called. There is the original book and ancient writing, but the one who reads and assesses it has a hidden identity. It takes a long performance and account to complete the lighting of the all sky earth, the fourfold sighting, fourfold cornering, measuring, fourfold staking, having the cord, stretching the cord in the sky on the earth, the four sides, the four corners by the maker, modeler, mother, father of life, of humankind giver of breath, giver of heart, bearer, upbringer in the light, the lasts of those born in the light, begotten in the light, worrier, knower of everything, whatever there is, sky, earth, lake, sea. This is the account. Here it is. Now still it ripples, now still it murmurs, ripples, it still sighs, still hums, and it is empty under the sky. Here follow the first words, the first eloquence. There is not yet one person, one animal, bird, fish, crab, tree, rock, hollow, canyon, meadow, forest. Only the sky above is there. The face of the earth is not yet clear. Only the sea alone is pooled under the sky. There is nothing whatever gathered together. It is at rest. Not a thing stirs. It is held back kept at rest under the sky. Whatever there is that might be simply is not there. Only the pooled water, only the calm sea, only it alone is pooled. Whatever might be is simply not there. Only murmurs, ripples in the dark, in the night. Only the maker, modeler alone, sovereign plumed serpent, the bearers, begetters are in the water, a glittering light. They are there. They are enclosed in quetzal feathers in blue-green, thus the name Plumed Serpent. They are great knowers, great thinkers in their very being. And of course there is the sky, and there is also the heart of sky. This is the name of the God as it is spoken. And then came his word. He came here to the sovereign Plumed Serpent, here in the darkness in the early dawn. He spoke with the sovereign Plumed Serpent, and they talked. Then they thought, then they worried. They agreed with each other. They joined their words, their thoughts. How should the sowing be and the dawning? Who is to be the provider, nurturer? Let it be this way. Think about it. This water should be removed, emptied out from the formation of the earth's own plate and platform. Then should come the sowing, the dawning of the sky earth. But there will be no high days and no bright praise for our work, our design, until the rise of human work, of human design, they said. And then the earth arose because of them. It was simply their word that brought it forth. For the forming of the earth, they said, earth. It arose suddenly, just like a cloud, like a mist now forming, unfolding. Then the mountains were separated from the water. All at once, the great mountains came forth. 
By their genius alone, by their cutting edge alone, they carried out the conception of the mountain plain whose face grew instant groves of cypress and pine. Such was the formation of earth when it was brought forth by the heart of sky, heart of earth, as they are called, since they were the first to think of it. The sky was set apart, and the earth was set apart in the midst of the waters. Such was their plan when they thought, when they worried about the completion of their work. So we now have contact between Europe and the Americas and writing spreads and print spreads and more and more the world is becoming one integrated whole and literature from different parts of the world starts to circulate more fully and more quickly. There's more translation than ever before, which is why in 1827, a conversation takes place in a small remote part of Eastern Germany, in the city of Weimar, which numbers 7,000 inhabitants. One of this inhabitant is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, one of the famous writers of, of his time. And he, by this time, he's at, at an advanced age, has acquired an assistant, Ackermann. And Ackermann makes a habit of coming over to Goethe and to help him, and Goethe dictates to him. And so he becomes indispensable to Goethe. Now, Ackermann has left his wife, his fiance, and his life behind in order to fully dedicate himself to Goethe. Goethe doesn't really pay him anything, so he can barely make ends meet. So he comes up with this idea of recording their conversation. He asks Goethe for permission to publish their conversations in order for Ackermann to get, earn some money, but Goethe rejects the idea for as long as he's alive, he won't allow Ackermann to, record, to publish their conversations. But after his death, he would be allowed to do it, and this is exactly what Ackermann does. And it is in one of those conversations on, December, on January 31st, 1827, that Ackermann records the conversation that, that, that produced the idea of world literature. Where Goethe comes up with the idea that a new age is upon us in which we are not only determined by the literature of our own nation or of classical antiquity only, but he reads much more widely. He reads Chinese novels. He reads Sanskrit. He falls in love with, with a Persian poet. He reads much more widely than ever before. Most of his contemporaries mock him, but he holds on to this idea that we now live in a world of world literature. Wednesday, January 31st, dined with Goethe. Within the last few days since I saw you, I've read many and various things, especially a Chinese novel, which occupies me still and seems to me very remarkable. 
Chinese novel. That must look strange enough. Not so much as you might think. The Chinamen think, act, and feel almost exactly like us. And we soon find that we are perfectly like them, accepting that all they do is more clear, more pure, and decorous than with us. With them, all is orderly, citizen-like, without great passion or poetic flight. And there is a strong resemblance to my Hermann and Dorothea, as well as to the English novels of Richardson. They likewise differ from us inasmuch as with them, external nature is always associated with the human figures. You always hear the goldfish splashing in the pond. The birds are always singing on the bough. The day is always serene and sunny. The night is always clear. There is much talk about the moon, but it does not alter the landscape. Its light is conceived to be as bright as the day itself, and the interior of the house is as neat and elegant as their pictures. For instance, I heard the lovely girls laughing, and when I got a sight of them, they were sitting on cane chairs. There, you have at once the present situation, for cane chairs are necessarily associated with the greatest lightness and elegance. Then, there is an infinite number of legends which are constantly introduced into the narrative and are applied almost like proverbs. As for instance, one of a girl who was so light and graceful in the feet that she could balance herself on a flower without breaking it. And then another of a young man so virtuous and brave that in his 30th year he had the honor to talk with the emperor. Then there is another of two lovers who showed such great purity during long acquaintance that when they were on one occasion obliged to pass the night in the same chamber, they occupied the time with conversation and did not approach one another. And in the same way, there are innumerable other legends, all turning upon what is moral and proper. It is by this severe modification in everything that the Chinese empire has sustained itself for thousands of years and will endure hereafter. I find highly remarkable contrast to this Chinese novel in the Chansons de Béranger, which have, almost every one, some immoral, licentious subject for their foundation, and which would be extremely odious to me if managed by a genius inferior to Béranger. He, however, has made them not only tolerable but pleasing. Tell me yourself, is it not remarkable that the subjects of the Chinese poet should be so thoroughly moral and those of the first French poet of the present day be exactly the contrary? Such a talent as Béranger's would find no field in the moral subjects. You're right. The very perversions of his time have revealed and developed his better nature. But is this Chinese romance one of their best? By no means. The Chinese have thousands of them and have already when our for and had already when our forefathers were still living in the woods. I am more and more convinced that poetry is the universal possession of mankind, revealing itself everywhere and at all times in hundreds and hundreds of men. One makes it a little better than another and swims on the surface a little longer than another, that is all. Herr von Matheson must not think he is the man, nor must I think I am the man, but each must say to himself that the gift of poetry is by no means so very rare, and that nobody need think very much of himself because he has written a good poem. But really, we Germans are very likely to fall too easily from the, into this pedantic conceit when we do not look, look beyond the narrow circle which surrounds us. I therefore like to look about me in foreign nations and advise everyone to do the same. National literature is now rather an unmeaning term, the epoch of world literature as at hand, and everyone must strive to hasten its approach. But while we thus value what is foreign, we must not bind ourselves to anything in particular and regard it as a model. We must not give this value to the Chinese or the Serbian or Calderon or the Nibelungen. But if we really want a pattern, 
we must always return to the ancient Greeks, in whose works the beauty of mankind is constantly represented. All the rest we must look at only historically, appropriating to ourselves what is good so far as it goes. I was glad to hear Goethe talk at length on a subject of such importance. The bells of passing sledges allured us to the window. As we expected that the long procession which went out to Belvedere this morning would return about this time. Goethe, meanwhile, continued his instructive conversations. We talked about Alexander Manzoni, and he told me that Court Reinhardt, Count Reinhardt, not long since, saw Manzoni at Paris, where, as a young author of celebrity, he had been received well in society, and that he was now living happily on his estate in the neighborhood of Milan with a young family and his mother. Manzoni wants nothing except to know what a good poet he is and what rights belong to him as such. He has too much respect for history, and on this account, he's always adding notes to his pieces, by which he shows how faithful he has been to detail. Now, though his facts may be historical, his characters are not so, any more than Mytoas and Iphigenia. No poet has ever known the historical characters which he has painted. If he had, he could scarcely have made use of them. The poet must know what effects he wants to produce and relegate the nature of his characters accordingly. If I had tried to make Egmont, as history represents him, the father of a dozen children, his light-hearted proceedings would have appeared very absurd. I needed an Egmont more in harmony with his own actions and my poetic views. And this is, as Clara says, my Egmont. What would be the use of poets if they only repeated the record of the historian? The poet must go further and give us, if possible, something higher and better. All the characters of Sophocles bear something of that great poet's lofty soul. And it is the same with the characters of Shakespeare. This is as it ought to be. Nay, Shakespeare goes further and makes his Romans Englishmen. And there, too, he is right, for otherwise his nation would not have understood him. Here again, the Greeks were so great that they regarded fidelity to historic facts less than the treatment of them by the poet. We have, fortunately, a fine example in Philoctetes, which subject has been treated by all three of the great tragedians, and lastly, and best, by Sophocles. This poet's excellent play has, fortunately, come down to us entire, while of the Philoctetes of Aeschylus and Euripides only fragments have been found, although sufficient to show how they manage the subject. If time permitted, I would restore these pieces, as I did the Phaeton of Euripides. It would be to me no unpleasant or useless task. In this subject, the problem was very simple, namely to bring Philoctetes with his bow from the island of Lemnos. But the method of doing this was the business of the poet, and here, each could show the power of his invention, and one could excel another. Ulysses must fetch him, but shall he be known by Philoctetes or not? And if not, how shall he be disguised? Shall Ulysses go alone, or shall he have companions, and who shall they be? In Aeschylus, there is no companion. In Euripides, it is Diomed. In Sophocles, the son of Achilles. Then. In what situation is Philoctetes to be found? Shall the island be inhabited or not? And if inhabited, shall any sympathetic soul have taken compassion on him or not? And so, with a hundred other things, which are all at the discretion of the poet, and in the selection and omission of which one may show his superiority in wisdom to another. Here is the grand point, and our present poets should do like the ancients, they should not be always asking whether a subject has been used before and to look to south or north for unheard of adventures, which are often barbarous enough, and merely make an impression as incidents, but to make something of a simple subject by a masterly treatment requires intellect and great talent, and these we do not find. Some passing sledges again allured us to the window, but it was not the expected train from Belvedere. We laughed, and we talked about trivial matters. (laughs) 
So we now have the idea of world literature and we have the reality of world literature fueled by print and, and, and exchange and trade, world trade. And we really have this wonderful, wonderful situation where more and more people, including in provincial places like Weimar, can read the literature from remote places and remote times. So I realize that we've been sort of telling a story of progress, progress in part fueled by new technologies like print. But these new technologies also have a downside because the more complicated the means of reproducing texts are, the less likely they are in the hands of authors and readers. Print is complicated, it's, it's expensive, and it's easy to control by the state. And this becomes a particular problem in the 20th century and particularly in, in the case of totalitarian states like Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Which is why the Russian Sappho, Anna Akhmatova, is afraid to publish her poets. She knows, in fact, that she cannot publish her poems. The state has monopoly in print. But she's even afraid to put down her words on paper because the secret police might search her apartment and she might get into trouble that way. So what Akhmatova does is that she composes the poem by hand on paper. She then learns it by heart and then she burns the paper on which she has written it. And she teaches the poem to a group of female friends and they become the memory, they become, their memory becomes the paper on which she writes her poems. To their annoyance, she sometimes makes corrections. And then she, they have to remember the corrections. Very presciently, her second husband was a specialist in cuneiform. So she was interested in the history of writing. So very accurately, she described her situation as pre-Gutenberg. She says, it's as if we had sat down with Gutenberg and were forced to live in a pre-Gutenberg world in which the printing press had never been invented. So this is how her poems circulate and only after the death of Stalin is a second form of circulation possible, namely Samitstad, the kind of uh, publication that is done not by the printing press but by typewriters and sometimes photographs. Samitstad, the, the Russian word for self-publishing. So this underground world emerges uh, in which the, the still, it's still pre-Gutenberg because there's still no printing press, because the state still has power, the power over the printing press, but this underground system of Samistad is invented, and that will ultimately contribute to bring down the Soviet Union. Now the poem, the poem in which Ahmatova, on which she writes, on which she works for several decades, and which is circulated first by memory, and then in the form of Samistad, is called Requiem. No, not under the vault of alien skies, and not under the shelter of alien wings. I was with my people then, there where my people unfortunately were. In the terrible years of the Yezhov terror, I spent 17 months in the prison lines of Leningrad. Once someone recognized me. Then a woman with bluish lips standing behind me 
who of course had never heard me called by my name before, woke up from the stupor to which everyone had succumbed and whispered in my ear, everyone spoke in whispers there, can you describe this? And I answered, yes, I can. Then something that looked like a smile passed over what had once been her face. Mountains bow down to this grief, mighty rivers cease to flow, but the prison gates hold firm and behind them are the prisoners' burrows and mortal woe. For someone a fresh breeze blows, for someone the sunset luxuriates, we wouldn't know. We are those who everywhere hear only the rasp of the hateful key and the soldier's heavy tread. We rose as if for an early service, trudged through the savaged capital and met there more lifeless than the dead. The sun is lower and the Niva mistier, but hope keeps seeing from afar the verdict and her tears gush forth, already she's cut off from the rest, as if they painfully wrenched life from her heart, as if they brutally knocked her flat. But she goes on, staggering, alone. Where now are my chance friends of those two diabolical years? What do they imagine is in Siberia's storms? What appears to them dimly in the circle of the moon? I am sending my farewell greeting to them. That was when the ones who smiled were the dead, glad to be at rest. And like a useless appendage, Leningrad swung from its prisons. And when, senseless from torment, regiments of convicts marched, and the short songs of farewell were sung by locomotive whistles, the stars of death stood above us, and innocent Russia writhed under bloody boots and under the tires of the black Marias. They laid you away at dawn. I followed you like a mourner. In the dark front room, the children were crying. By the icon shelf, the candle was dying. On your lips was the icon's chill, the deathly sweat on your brow, unforgettable. I will be like the wives of the Stelzi howling under the Kremlin towers. Quietly flows the quiet dawn. Yellow moon slips into a home. He slips in with cap askew. He sees a shadow, yellow moon. This woman is ill. This woman is alone. Husband in the grave, son in prison, say a prayer for me. No, it is not I, it is somebody else who is suffering. I would not have been able to bear what happened. Let them shroud it in black and let them carry off the lanterns, night. For 17 months, I've been crying out, calling you home. I flung myself at the hangman's feet. You are my son and my horror. Everything is confused forever. And it's not clear to me who is a beast now, who is a man, and how long before the execution. And there are only dusty flowers and the chinking of the censer and tracks from somewhere to nowhere. And staring me straight in the eyes and threatening impending death is an enormous star. And a stone word fell on my still living breast, never mind, I was ready. I will manage somehow. Today I have so much to do. I must kill memory once and for all. I must turn my soul to stone. I must learn to live again, unless summer's ardent rustling is like a festival outside my window. For a long time I've foreseen this brilliant day, deserted house. I learned how faces fall, how tear darts from under eyelids, how suffering traces lines of stiff cuneiform on cheeks, how locks of ashen blonde or black turn silver suddenly. Smiles fade on submissive lips, a fear trembles in a dry laugh, and I pray not for myself alone, but for all those who stood there with me in cruel cold and in July's heat, 
at that blind red wall. Once more the day of remembrance draws near. I see, I hear, I feel you. The one they almost had to drag at the end and the one who tramps her native land no more. And the one who, tossing her beautiful head, said, coming here is like coming home. I'd like to name them all by name, but the list has been confiscated and is nowhere to be found. I have woven a wide mantle for them from their meager overheard words. I will remember them always and everywhere. I will never forget them, no matter what comes. And if they gag my exhausted mouth, through which a hundred million scream, then may the people remember me on the eve of my Remembrance Day. And if ever in this country they decide to erect a monument to me, I consent to that honor under these conditions. That it stand neither by the sea where I was born, my last tie with the sea is broken, nor in the Tsar's garden near the cherished pine stump where inconsolable shade looks for me, but here where I stood for 300 hours and where they never unbolted the doors for me. This, lest in blissful death I forget the rumbling of the black Marias, forget how the detested door slammed shut and an old woman howled like a wounded animal. And may the melting snow stream like tears from my motionless lids of bronze and a prison dove coo in the distance and the ships of the Neva sail calmly on. Thank you, Kevin. If everyone wants to come. The readers, please come. Thank you. Thank you. I think reception yeah. is a yeah. good idea. So let's put up a little bit more of a light and then every question you would like to uh, ask, ask him. I think it's the first time in the history of mankind that these texts has been uh, written, that has been read together, which also stands for something extraordinary, maybe a little moment like in the tiny town of Weimar. So Martin, thank you for bringing us all together.